so thankful for being together. So thankful to see each and every one, and so hopefully to urge you to take your Bibles and open them, look at the things that we have to say, examine what we say concerning what God's Word teaches, and only accept that which God's truth is revealed. Leonardo da Vinci made the statement, the greatest deception men suffer is from their own opinions. It was Plato who said, the worst of all deceptions is self-deception. And truly, the Bible warns us about deceiving ourselves. We find it in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 18 through 23. We see it in Galatians 6 and verse 3. We're told about it in James 1, verse 22, and James 1 and verse 26 as well. And also in 1 John 1 and verse 8. I want to look at all five of these verses this evening and see what we can learn concerning what the Bible does teach by way of warning us. It must be something that we're capable of doing or else there would not be the warning issue. So what is this about deceiving ourselves? Certainly we can deceive ourselves when it comes to our own thinking. In 1 Corinthians 3, beginning with verse 18, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God. That's reading from the New King James. The King James is very similar in what it stated in that 18th verse. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems... That's the word that we find in the New King James and in the King James. But if you look at the American Standard Version, or if you look at the English Standard Version, or if you look at the New American Standard Bible, you'll see that word seems to be the word if any man thinketh, or if any man thinks. So truly, is what the verses is saying, we can deceive ourselves. When you think about it, and the situation at Corinth, this is where we've read the verses that we read from 1 Corinthians 3. The situation at Corinth was that there were conflicts, there was divisions, and all of that was because of the very thing that Paul spoke about in those verses that we read, human wisdom. In Verses 3 and 4, if we back up and look at what is said there, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when, when, for when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? So truly, the problems, the situation at Corinth, was because of the very thing that Paul warned about, human wisdom. In fact, Barrett, in his commentary on the first epistle to the Corinthians, says that self-deception is the common fate of those who mistakenly fancy themselves wise. And that's what Paul said in the verses that we just read, that if anyone has the wisdom of this world he says if he's wise in this age, he needs to become fools, knowing that the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And it, too, was a problem in Corinth 
of pride. We see that if we go into chapter 4 and read verse 6. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. So here is worldly wisdom, here is pride. These things are figuring in to the problems, the situation being what it is here in the church at Calvary. And the answer we must give to our own thinking is what verse 18 says, to become fools. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. So that's the answer to being deceived by ourselves concerning what it is that we think. Let us consider, uh, consider all of our human wisdom as worthless, as futile. For indeed it is. At least before God, it's foolishness. So should it not be at least that to us as well? Well, that was the situation at Calvin. What about today? What about you and I? You know, we attribute too much to our own knowledge, to our own education. You know, we think we really know it. And that's the attitude of the age that we live in. It's the attitude of the world that we live in. And it's very easy for us of our own to accept the attitudes of the world that's all around us. We think we more, we think we know more than we really know. Well, you know, we think we know more than we really know and all of that's overconfidence. That's what really it all amounts to. And it's easy to be overconfident. You know, we think of our own reasoning. We think of our own way of thinking to be just as good. We don't seek the revealed word of God. And yet we're told, remember, the wise man said in Proverbs chapter 3, beginning with verse 5, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. We see that mistake being made when David was transporting the Ark of the Covenant that had been captured by the Philistines. And we know that he transported it on a cart when that was not at all the way that God said that the Ark of the Covenant was to be transported from one place to the next. And we know we're familiar with that story of Isaac, who because the oxen stumbled, he feared that the Ark would fall off the cart and suffer damage. It was the most sacred piece or the most sacred item of furniture that God commanded Moses. It was that piece by which God would be in the most holy of holies, whether it was the tabernacle or the temple, and it was that means through the ark that God would communicate with the priest. And yet here David is carrying it on a cart, contrary to what God says. And in First Chronicles, notice what David says. When all of it's been said and done, Ezra has been struck dead, and they're still in the process of getting this ark out of the house of Abinadad back to Jerusalem. He said, For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. See that? We did not consult him with the proper order. 
for the proper way of doing things. What had David done? He had done according to what he thought. David deceived himself into thinking that this would be in an appropriate way, an appropriate manner of getting the ark back to where it rightfully belongs. So we can deceive ourselves. If David can deceive himself, we can do the same. And in the day of Jeremiah, Jeremiah had the responsibility of telling the children of Judah that the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, were coming and execute judgment because of their sin. And notice what he said in Jeremiah chapter 37, beginning with verse 9. Thus says the Lord, Do not deceive yourselves, saying, the Chaldeans will surely depart from us, for they will not depart. For though you had, and this is Jeremiah imagining, though you had defeated the whole army of the Chaldeans who fight against you, and there remained only wounded men among them, they would rise up, every man in his tent, and burn the city with fire. So we see what Judah was thinking, what they were deceiving themselves. And this is the very thing that Jeremiah says, do not deceive yourself. Don't get this idea that, well, you know, we're going to defeat them. They're not going to come back. Jeremiah said, if you, if you had defeated them and all that was left was the wounded, they'll be back and they'll destroy this city. Don't deceive yourself. So we see how easy of a matter it is. You know, sometimes we even reason. And it's easy for us to reason. Well, you know, I don't see anything wrong with it. See our way of thinking? What do we need to do? We need to do like David said. We need to consult him about the proper order that we are to conduct our lives in. Two, we can deceive ourselves when it comes to our own strength. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3, For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. I want us to be sure that we understand the context of what we're reading here in this sixth chapter. Back up in verse 1, we see that the subject is concerning the restoring of the area. In verse 1, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own burden. So this is the context. Restoring those that have erred, strayed, wandered from the truth. And so, as we saw in verse 1, it is the spiritual that are the help. And certainly in the process of restoring, something else is needed. Humility is needed. We see that in chapter 5 and verse 26, when it said, Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. There's no room, should be no room, for those attitudes and dispositions of heart in the life of any Christian. So humility is needed especially in this matter of restoring those that have erred from the truth. And so the point is, we are of little help in this matter of restoring if we think ourselves to be more spiritual than we really are. What I mean by that is we think we are more mature than we really are. 
What I'm saying is that we think we are stronger spiritually than we really are. And so then, we have warnings scattered throughout the scriptures concerning this matter of being overconfident. Even when it comes to our own strength, we see how it is when it comes to what we think, we can be overconfident. Same is true concerning thinking ourselves to be strong when we are really not as strong as we think we are. We can, again, be overconfident. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12 says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. This is the indication of a person's strength. We think we're strong enough to stand whatever it is that is coming upon us or that we're going into. It's a matter of strength. We can deceive ourselves. In 2 Corinthians 10, notice it says in verse 12, for we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. So again, this matter of strength is not a matter of comparison to you and me or for me to you. The comparison of strength and what our strength needs to be measured from the spiritual strength that we ought to have can only come from and only be determined by God's word. In Mark chapter 14, we find in verse 27, Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even if even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke more vehemently. If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. What's this an example of? This is an example of even Jesus' own apostles, even those that he had hand-chosen, that he had hand-picked, became self-deceived in their own thinking concerning their strength. They became overconfident, thinking themselves to be stronger than they really were. And what just, it wasn't just Peter, as we mentioned I think Reuben did in the Bible study this morning. Peter was the spokesman, but they all, all of the disciples said, likewise, if we, you know, if you die, we'll die with you. So it truly is the case of overconfidence. Overconfidence on the part of all of the apostles. And shouldn't that cause us to think? that appear these men that were in the very presence, can you imagine that being in the very presence of Jesus? To be with him, to eat with him, to talk with him, to see the miracles that he did, to hear the teaching through your own ears that Jesus taught. Can you imagine what that would be like? And yet, if they became overconfident, Surely this tells us how much on guard we need to be of being not deceived concerning our own spiritual strength. We can overestimate our strength. We can overestimate our ability to resist the things in this life that need to be resisted. You know, this attitude, I would never do what you did do we ever have that attitude when we hear of someone that we learn has committed sin, whatever that sin may be? Or, you know, I would never do what they did. Whether it was drinking, whether it was drugs, whether it was fornication, homosexuality, whatever, whatever the sin. We have, has the thought ever came into our mind when we heard this person did this? <laughs> you know, I, I'd never do what they did. Be careful. 
we may not be as strong as we think we are. We may be deceiving ourselves. We can think, we can still think of ourselves as a strong and faithful member. That's what we think of ourselves, but yet we're missing half of the services. But we can still think that we're a faithful Christian. You know, we can think that exposing ourselves to sin is not going to affect me. But let's remember 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 30. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good manners, good morals, good habits. Let's not be deceived. Because it's easy to be concerning our own strength. Another thing that it's easy to be deceived. It's easy to be deceived when it comes to our own conformity. And that's spoken about in James 1 and verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So we deceive ourselves when we are only willing to be hearers and not doers of the word. When we put ourselves in that position, we need to understand we have deceived ourselves. See, God requires conformity. And we conform, how else? But by obedience. That's how we conform to what God's word says. That's, what, that's how we conform to what God's word and what we hear from God's word. When we do, we conform, we obey. And so as James says in James 1 and verse 22 that we read a moment ago, be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. So we need to obey and understand that obedience is in order for us to enter the kingdom. Jesus said there in Matthew 7 and verse 21, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but it's he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So it's not a matter of saying, it's not a matter of hearing and being convinced that Jesus is the Lord, but it's a matter of doing, doing the will of the Father. And so obedience, conforming to what God commands us to do, is in order for us to have eternal life. And we have Jesus as our example. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being, having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. As Brother Matthew mentioned in his prayer a moment ago, Jesus lived the perfect life in obedience to the Father. He became that perfect sacrifice that it was through his blood that God is willing to atone for our sins, to forgive us of our sins if we will make application of that blood in obedience unto Christ in faith, repenting, confessing, and being married in baptism to the blood of Christ, to the death of Christ. And this is what the Hebrew writer is saying. He learned obedience by the things which he suffered, and being perfect in his obedience, he became the author of eternal salvation. If Jesus had not lived perfectly, he would not have been the one for us to have salvation through. But he learned obedience, he became perfect, and in doing so, he now is the author of eternal salvation to you and me on the condition that we obey him. Jesus obeyed the Father in all things. I love that statement that Jesus made when he said, I always do those things that please the Father. Shouldn't that be what you and I as a Christian ought to strive for each and every day of our lives? To always do those things that please the Father. 
If we do, then we can obey him and have that hope of eternal life. So if Jesus is our Lord, and how many times have we explained what the meaning of the word Lord means? It means ruler. So if we profess to Jesus to be Lord, if we do like those that we read back a moment ago in Matthew 7 and verse 21, we call him Lord, Lord. Then let's do the things that he commands us to do. If in truly he is our Lord. See, the problem is there's so many other things in life that can take the position, the prominence over the Lord. But let him be the prominent, the first. So, if he's our Lord, we're going to do what he says. And that's what Luke chapter 6 and verse 46 says. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I command you to do? So see, we've got Matthew 7, 21. Don't call me Lord, Lord. It's only he that does the will of my Father. And then he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? So we see what this Lord must mean to us, this word must mean to us, and to associate that word with Christ, to be willing to conform, because we know that faith alone is not going to save. In James chapter 2 and verse 24, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. And that harmonizes again with what James said in James 1 and verse 22. Don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers as well. So God requires conformity. We conform by being obedient. And sometimes, though, you know, we think that we're conforming when we hear. That may be why it's so difficult to do what James says, to not just be hearers, but doers. Because sometimes we get in our minds that we are conforming when we're hearing. You might say, well, what are you talking about? Well, let me illustrate. Sometimes we think if we hear sound teaching, then we conform. But that's not always the case. Do we always conform to sound teaching when we hear it? Why is it that sermon after sermon can be preached about different subjects and there's no changes that occur? Why are there sermons after sermons talking about not forsaking the assembly and then there's no changes in some people? Well, it may be that they think that they're hearing, don't forsake the assembly, and because they're hearing, they're conforming. See what I'm saying? Let's go another step. It may be that we think if we agree and if we commend sound teaching, then we're conforming. In other words, we hear sound teaching, we hear the gospel, we hear different subjects being spoken upon, we know and we understand it to be the truth, we appreciate those that, whether it's Bible class teachers or preachers that preach the things that they preach about difficult subjects, we commend them for it, but then again, do we think that just because we agree that we're conforming? Not necessarily. But some people think that way. And some people think that, you know, if I acknowledge that I have been rebuked, oh man, that sermon really hit me. <laughs> that sermon really, you know, people tell me that that, was, that sermon really uh, got on my toes. And I usually respond that, well, I wasn't aiming for your toes, I was aiming for your heart. But, you know, you've heard people say it, that, well, that, that sermon was right at me. Okay, you're acknowledging that what has been said by way of rebuke, you're acknowledging it, but are you going to conform? Did you just 
make you conform for you to acknowledge that, well, you know, that, that was a sermon I needed to hear. Well, very good, but are you going to conform? And I think a lot of people are in this condition. They think that if they attend where sound doctrine is demanded, that they conform. But I know that's not the truth. I've experienced situations where congregations have those that always preach the truth from the pulpit. But it went for years that certain ones of the elders did not believe the truth. And later on, truth always comes out and the church divides because here are men supposed to be in positions of leadership that all of these years have heard the teaching done that was right, but it never changed their thinking. And so, churches have divided, churches have split on that account. So, you know, if we think that we attend where sound doctrine is demanded, that we're conforming to that sound doctrine, not necessarily. Not necessarily. We may be deceiving ourselves. Another way we deceive ourselves is by our own words. In James 1, and I don't mean to be taking the Bible study away from you, Reuben. <laughs> James 1 and verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is vain. You see, he thinks he's religious. And that word religious, it's used only here in the sense in which it's used in James 1 and verse 26. Vain says of the word, careful of the externals of divine service. So, he thinks of himself as being pious, of being devoted, and being in a good relationship with God. But he's deceiving himself. And the point that James is making here concerns the fact that he's not controlling his tongue. See, we might not view that as a part of our religion. But, James says, it has everything to do with our own religion. You know, maybe that's why we don't feel guilty when we use profane or obscene words. Like what we're told in Ephesians 5, verse 29, for no one... Ephesians 5, 29, I don't think that's the right verse. <laughs> yeah, it's in Ephesians somewhere. Uh, one of you better know where that verse is right off. Help me out. 4, 29. All right, thank you. Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So, we're not to use profane, obscene words. Maybe that's why we don't feel guilty when we tell those crude or those insinuating jokes that sometimes is heard. Maybe that's why we don't feel guilty when we slander or gossip about others. Because we don't associate it with being religious. We don't associate it with, being, with, with religion. It has to do with everyday life. And so we somehow disassociate, disconnect what we are every day compared to what we claim to be as Christians. Well, if we're in that situation, we're doing exactly what James says, we're deceived. 
And it could be that this is why, too, we don't feel guilty when we use ugly or we use or we, we're harsh with others. All simply because we don't think that what we do with our tongues has anything to do with being religious. And yet James shows very clearly that it does. We need to learn that we can think that we're religiously right and not live the lifestyle. We can think that. We can think that we're in our religion with what we ought to be. But then we can turn around and be in our life whatever we want to be. So we can deceive ourselves about what self-control is all about. And we can think that we are exercising self-control. You know, I may not be controlling my tongue. I don't recognize that. But I'm not. I'm not controlling my tongue. But you know what? I'm controlling whether or not I commit fornication. I'm controlling that. And I'm controlling whether or not I'm addicted to drugs, to alcohol, I'm controlling all these other things, see. Those other things are the things that I think make up what religion is about. But, but something that is just as, as human as the tongue and what we speak and the words that we speak, I've just not been able to see because I've deceived myself into thinking that somehow what comes out of my mouth doesn't have any bearings upon what I'm supposed to be doing as a child of God. See, we may reason in our own minds that whatever it is, is not a part of being religious, being right with God. And I want us to understand when I'm using the term religious, that's what I'm talking about, being right with God. So I can fill in this blank with a number of things. I can reason in my own mind that what I want to say is not a part of being religious. I can reason in my own mind that how I dress is not a part of being religious. I can reason in my own mind that what I drink is not a part of my being religious. And I can believe and reason in my mind that what I watch is not a part of being religious. But again, if Jesus is our Lord, we do what he says. And again, that verse in Luke 6 and verse 46, why did you call me Lord, Lord, and do not, not do the things which I say? You know about this matter concerning being deceived with our own words. I like what Albert Barnes said in his notes on the New Testament on the commentary from James to Jude. A man may undoubtedly have many things in his character which seem to be evidences of the existence of religion in his heart. And yet there may be some one thing that shall show that all those evidences are false. Religion is designed to produce an, an effect on our whole conduct. And if there is any one thing in reference to which it does not bring us under its control, that one thing may show that all other appearances of piety are worthless. And I can agree with that statement wholeheartedly. We can deceive ourselves when it comes to our own sin. In 1 John 1 and verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
We do that by thinking we don't sin. We do that by thinking that what I'm doing <laughs> is not sin. You know why it's not sin? Because I'm doing it. That's why it's not sin. We justify our actions to ourselves by saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm just doing what I'm doing. You know, this is me. This, you know, this, this is me doing it. It's not somebody else. It's different. It's me. And so, I'm not gossiping. I'm not slandering. I'm just telling you what I think you need to know. Or, you know, I'm not stealing. I'm just using this money and, you know, eventually I'll pay it back. And, no, I'm, I'm not forsaken. I just had something that I needed to do. I just had some place I needed to go. So, no, I'm, I'm not forsaken the assembly. And, no, I'm not really lusting. I'm just looking because there's just nothing else to look at. This is me, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm not being unkind. I'm just telling it like it is. And so here we go. We are doing the very thing that we spoke of in 1 John 1 and verse 8. And not my, also, by not thinking that, that what I'm doing is sin, I can also be deceived by thinking that I can get away. I can get away with it. You know, the harlot thinks that she can hide. The proverb writer in Proverbs 30 and verse 20, this is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I've done no wickedness. So see, there is self-deception. This is me. I've not done no wrong. I've not done no, nothing sinful. But let us understand, God is not mocked. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he that sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not, or if we do not lose heart. This is a universal principle. It's true in the physical world. It's true in the spiritual world. What we sow is what we reap. And as I've always said, we need to understand that whatever it is we sow, whether in the physical or the spiritual world, we always reap more than we sow. You know, those two or three grains of beans that you put in a hill, you're hoping that you're going, to, you're going to get a mess of beans, aren't you? You hope you're, not, you hope you're going to get more than just the two or three beans that you put in the hill. The same is true of corn, the same is true of anything. So in the physical realm, whatever we sow, we expect to receive more. And that's generally true. Well, it's also generally true that whatever we sow spiritually, if we sow to the flesh, we also receive a bumper crop. And I've heard the expression used that sometimes we intentionally sow to the flesh, but we hope for a crop failure. But friends, that's not what this verse is saying. This verse is saying, whatever you sow, you reap. God is not mocked. Let us not be deceived. Sin will find us out. If there's ever a verse in the Old Testament <laughs> that any of us and all of us need to memorize, I think it's this one. I think it's Numbers 32, verse 23, which says, But if you do not do so, then take note, you have sinned against the Lord. 
and look at the last part of the verse and be sure your sin will find you out. You may hide it. And some people do. Some people are very good at hiding sin. They're, they're very good. They're so good, they hide it all their lives. They take it with them to the grave. Their sin is hid. Nobody knows it. But there's coming a judgment day. And we're going to stand before a judge who's everything that we've said, everything that we've done, everything that we've even thought in our minds, they are open and naked unto him. So yes, as good as we may have been at hiding our sin, it will still find us out. But see, the important thing is to make sure that the sins that we commit, we don't hide them. We do like what David did in Psalms 53. We acknowledge our sin, and the Lord will forgive us. Acknowledge it. Don't hide it. Because in the judgment day, it's going to be too late to do anything about it. So here we've seen what we've seen in the manner of deceiving ourselves. We deceive ourselves in our own thinking sometimes. We deceive ourselves in thinking that we're stronger than maybe we really are. We deceive ourselves sometimes in our conforming to what God says to do. Sometimes we deceive ourselves into the, the use of the words that we say. We deceive ourselves even when it comes to our own sins. So, I think this helps to establish the truthfulness that the greatest deception that men suffer is from their own opinions. I think it helps us to see the truthfulness that the worst of all deception is self-deception. Let us not be deceived. It's easy to be done. But we have warnings, and I hope that our lesson in looking at those warnings have helped us and will help us, not just today, not just tonight, but in the days, months, years ahead, to understand and know, let us not be deceived, because God is not mocked. Let us not be deceived that it will be in flame and fire that Jesus will come and take vengeance upon those that know not God and that obey not the gospel. And so if you're here tonight and you need to obey the gospel, now is time. Now is the opportunity. We don't know if, if or when there will ever be another. This may be it. Render obedience to the gospel. We've talked about it through our sermon. Hear the word. Believe it. Repent of your sin. Confess with your mouth that Christ is the Son of God and be buried in baptism where the blood of Christ will wash away your sins. And if we're here and we've obeyed that gospel and there's sin in our lives, don't deceive ourselves. Sin is sin whether I commit it or you commit it. It's still sin. God is no respect to a person. Sin, regardless of who we are, will separate us from God. And there's no sin that will enter heaven. That's why God gave. That's why Christ died. In order for us to have access to heaven, having our sins forgiven. And we've been given the two ways by which we can have sins forgiven. If we've never obeyed the gospel, we know what we need to do. If we have obeyed the gospel in sin, we know what we need to do. We need to repent and pray. So that there's nothing that hinders us from entering into heaven, that place where there is no sin. If we can assist you in either of these ends, please let it be known by coming to the front. While together we stand to sing.